Um, good morning, um, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. I wish, first of all, to add my voice to those who have already thanked uh, Chief Justice Sundarish Mene of uh, Singapore for hosting this meeting. I also wish to thank Lord uh, Thomas and the steering committee for the excellent uh, arrangements that have been put in place for this meeting. We have a very important topic to discuss this morning about meeting the needs of court users. We have just been through a pandemic which has affected each one of us, each of our jurisdictions, our work, our economies, our lives. And perhaps the people that have come out worst of all have been the court users when there are matters who are stuck in our courts because the courts were not sitting either not at all or only in part. We must have learned lessons and I uh, want to discuss what's the way forward, what have we learned, how do we plan for the future to make sure that the needs of court users are fully answered without compromising the integrity of the courts, without uh, compromising the rule of law. And we therefore need to discuss it very fully as we move forward. Without wasting too much time, let me invite um, Lord Justice, Chief Justice Orsop from Australia, the Federal Courts of Australia, to take us through this topic and we follow up with the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to be asked to speak uh, at, the, uh, at this important conference of CIFOC. May I say at the outset um, how significant the setting up and growth of CIF CIFOC was and has been. Um, in particular, may I say, um, uh, Lord Thomas should be congratulated for his inspirational role in that establishment and growth. Three of the matters which, as I would understand it, inspired Lord Thomas to see this forum established were, first, a recognition of the value of the contribution of specialist, skilled and public judicial decision-making in commercial matters. Uh, secondly, the importance of a healthy, of the healthy growth of international commercial law that only publicly available court judgments from recognised and skilled commercial courts can ensure. Uh, and thirdly, the need for a close relationship, a close understanding by the courts of the needs of the commercial community in dispute resolution. Uh, and the maintenance of the rule of law, and also by the commercial community of how courts operate, both to be gained by dialogue and engagement between courts uh, and the commercial communities which they serve. All three of these matters that inspired uh, Lord Thomas can be seen in this, uh, as the subject of today's session that is meeting the needs of court users. The pandemic of the last year and its actual and potential catastrophic consequences um, have heightened and not lessened the importance of these matters. In responding physically and technologically to the crisis of the pandemic, many courts have revealed um, how they can maintain and develop contact and direct engagement with the commercial community and how they can maintain the rule of law. The pandemic accelerated courts into online spaces, providing the capacity for hearings and dispute resolution to continue online via video conferencing and various proprietary mechanisms. Uh, and this has and will reduce the costs for all court users, ultimately, I think. The examples include reduced costs in transportation for witnesses, 
and clients simply wanting to supervise their cases. Reduced costs of delay by employing innovative communication tools and deformalizing some procedures at least. And greater flexibility for families and parents with homeschooling or childcare responsibilities, which provides more opportunities uh, to uh, earn income and the potential for greater diversity in uh, those who uh, uh, are in the profession. These measures facilitate access to justice, not, by, not just by reducing financial barriers, but by normalizing uh, online communications in a way that provides uh, greater access to choice of legal representation uh, from people who are not necessarily required to be local, uh, including very often, uh, not so much in commercial law, but in other forms, in pro bono lawyers from farther afield than the particular jurisdiction where the court is sitting. But we must be uh, aware that technology-assisted justice may shift or introduce a burden of work and a cost on users, as well as a reduction of cost. Internet, hardware, online document preparation, preparation all cost money and we must be aware of the impact of reduced human interaction on speedy and sensible problem solving uh, an issue that can sometimes be resolved or clarified in one quick meeting uh, with a raised eyebrow or a uh, or, or a look can sometimes be lost in translation uh, over the internet Video conferencing and online communications may also be inappropriate for certain types of matters, um, such as those involving particularly complex or sensitive material uh, and uh, an unwieldy number of participants or where true human engagement is necessary. Uh, as discussed in CIFOC's second COVID-19 memorandum, which is now published, Party consent is a fundamental safeguard. It is a matter that judges individually and collectively should be alive to, particularly where one or both parties are self-represented, perhaps not often in commercial law, uh, and may not be armed with information or experience. The benefit of technology as a cost-saving measure and thereby a facilitator of access to justice must be balanced with the administration of justice for which justice must also be seen to be done. The strength of commercial courts depends on public confidence and trust, not just access, which means that technological innovation needs to be tempered by predictability and principle. Fairness, consistency, independence and reasoned judgment cannot be compromised. I think the important thing to remember is that these considerations will work themselves out via, if I may use the expression, via a process of lived experience. Logical deduction and, and abstracted reasoning uh, and prediction will never be a substitute for human engagement in such an intensely important area as the administration of justice. The pre-recorded contributions that we've seen highlighted the court's complementary role to arbitration. The complementarity of public and private dispute resolution is of great importance. The clips also highlight the importance of known, clear and consistent legal principle in commercial law, underpinning the rule of law. A healthy worldwide system of commercial courts working harmoniously and supported and fostered by forums such as CIFO is crucial to this. We should as courts seek as part of our core operations to engage with the profession and the commercial community, including the arbitration community to better understand their range of needs and expectations. That engagement with the profession was something that Sir Peter Gross and I stressed yesterday in our comments on case management, uh, on the work we've done on case, that CIPOC has done on case management. 
First, there is a crucial role that the legal profession plays as a bridge between the courts and the public, generally and in particular the commercial community. A legal culture of strong energetic case management directed at solving commercial disputes of clients is critical. Meetings and dialogue with the profession is essential, keeping bar and law associations, both national and international, informed through updates, guides or practice notes, by facilitating discussion and user group meetings, by seeking views at the level of case management and court innovation, and by keeping doors open to feedback. But direct engagement with the commercial community, a purpose of this forum, uh, is also possible and appropriate. Forms of review, 360 degree review, if you like, uh, can be developed. There are now streaming, now streaming of court hearings is common. Uh, that can be done with lectures of meetings between courts and users in a way that maintains the integrity and independence of the courts. Uh, courts have not always put themselves out there, if I may use that expression, but perhaps they should. It is, they are not mere service providers, I accept, they administer justice, and there's a very big difference. But justice at its heart is serving a community, and as such, courts must continue to be responsive, self-reflective, approachable, and adaptable. The World Justice Project's 2020 Rule of Law Index is telling. In the past year, the indices of fundamental rights and constraints on government powers and absence of corruption continued to decline on a global scale as compared to the indices of civil justice and regulatory enforcement, which continued to improve. Strong international courts support the rule of law both nationally and internationally through business ties and respect for binding dispute resolution according to principle and precedent. Despite some factors challenging the rule of law, civil justice continues to remain strong and will continue to be strong if our courts remain flexible and innovative. So they are desirable, competitive and accessible forums whilst also remaining reliable and trustworthy institutions. This is a balance, the challenges of which we negotiate and discuss in forums such as this, which process of dialogue and discussion encourages confidence. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief Justice Alsop. Uh, I would think it would be helpful for us to hear from the uh, uh, civil law jurisdiction, I think, uh, Judge uh, Dr. Jan Tokmit is going to uh, speak now. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Justice Vanning. Good morning and good afternoon and uh, good evening to you all. Um, first of all, uh, uh, and speaking also from my German colleagues Heike Hummelmeier and Patrick Malin, I would like to express our uh, deep gratitude to our Singapore host, to you, Chief Justice Menon and to your team for bringing us together. It's a real, it's a great pleasure. And having the opportunity to share and discuss with you some thoughts on user needs and some of our ex German experience is a privilege and great honor for me. Um, during this session, our aim is uh, to identify the needs of court users and also to spot instruments that we may uh, use in order to reveal these needs. But let me take a step back for a moment and uh, spend some seconds on what I think is a prerequisite or precondition for a widely accepted judicial service. The term court users sounds unfamiliar to me and my German colleagues. In our language, we do not have an exact translation of this term. Um, instead, we typically refer to the parties or to people looking for justice. It appears to me that this is not a mere issue of language, that whether it may also reflect a certain mindset of a national judicial system, which in our context, commercial litigation, um, has to envision by heart that parties should be 
at the center of its attention and that courts are providing services that are dedicated to court users. It is the mindset that matters, as Peter Gross put it yesterday in a different context. Although we run, as I may say so, a quite elaborated and efficient court system that is firmly based on the rule of law and which is able to handle in a numerous uh, um, number of cases at very low cost for the parties, thereby providing speedy uh, justice to the people on a large scale, we have faced a disproportionate um, and alarming decline in commercial court litigation um, during the last decade. Though we maintain a remarkable number of recognized chambers of commercial matters at the first instance level, with a senior judge sitting together with two lay judges that are recruited from the business community in order to bring in uh, commercial expertise, a brilliant idea, I would guess, we had to realize that these specialized bodies have lost ground. The reason for this decline in case numbers is not quite clear and it is subject to ongoing academic research. But whatever the res results of this academic research may be, we should ask ourselves in the first place whether or not the courts as well as the legislature have sufficiently listened to a certain class of court users and their needs? To me, the answer appears to be quite clear. So time has come to reinvent the system of commercial adjudication in Germany and again to focus on the needs of this specific class of users. Very recently, two commercial courts have been founded in the southern state of Baden-Württemberg, the home of international car producers like Mercedes-Benz and Porsche, that is a very encouraging step and hopefully legislative steps will soon follow addressing crucial issues such as choice of forum, court language and confidentialities. These are issues which we uh, urgently have to address. And so what are the tools that we are using for the purpose of uh, identifying user needs in the course of adapting our uh, court system? What proved to be extremely helpful is to hold conferences, conferences bringing courts as well as legislators together with both representatives from the legal profession and in-house legal counsels. And since businesses act in a global economy and users of domestic commercial courts come from all over the world, um, it is crucial to bring in international experience. Therefore, it appears very useful to invite representatives of the legal profession from abroad to share their views on how commercial courts should work. And in this particular context, also CIFIC may serve and does serve a, a highly valuable platform for exchanging views on user needs as we do today and by taking a comparative approach to learn from different jurisdictions how they deal with user needs. And at this point, I would like to express my deep gratitude to Lord Thomas, the steering committee and the secretariat to Sir Robin and Grace for developing and maintaining this extraordinary um, network. However, once user needs are uh, identified and implemented into um, uh, civil procedure laws, as well as into uh, courts practice, it is also crucial to safeguard that commercial courts continuously have a close look at the development of user needs, especially at each court's level. In some of our court districts, we have made good experiences um, in bringing together court members and representatives of the legal profession on a regular basis, so-called clearing committees. During these round table meetings, relevant issues can be addressed informally and users have the chance of expressing their needs, giving feedback to users, uh, feedback to, to the course, of course. Um, uh, to sum up, what we should strive for is A, establishing a wholehearted feedback culture, not on the merits. This is, of course, the exclusive domain of the appeal courts, but with respect to the way we are handling commercial cases. And B, putting users, both the claimants and the defendants in the focus of a daily routine. Again, it's the mindset that matters. 
And with this, uh, I hand over to our distinguished co-chairs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Tolkmet. Uh, that was um, an interesting perspective. Uh, we now have the opportunity for contributions from the participants. Can I ask you to use the hand up uh, uh, that you have on your screens to, if you have a contribution to make, either in relation to uh, how your particular court may have been able to respond to the consequences of the uh, pandemic, uh, or uh, any suggestions that you have or have developed in relation to your courts, keeping in touch with user needs as have been discussed and identified by uh, Chief Justice Orsop and Judge Tolkmet. Can I invite contributions from the uh, participants? Yes. Um, Rich Travissa, thank you. Uh, hello, good morning and good, good afternoon, good night for everyone. Um, in our court, the NCC, we started from uh, uh, the first case with uh, providing uh, a survey to the parties after uh, the, the finalization of uh, the judgment of the case. And it proved helpful. The, the uh, results were anonymous, of course, but it proved helpful um, to see where we could uh, give ex extra attention to some areas, uh, for example, uh, on, the, on certain, uh, uh, the, certain hiccups in the system, or uh, uh, the wish for a court reporter to be present in every case. So it has been helpful. But that's what I have to add. Thank you very much. That, that is a useful um, contribution and thought, actually. Um, Justice Corkerell. Yes, good morning. I don't want to tread on the toes of Sir Julian, who will be talking about our relationship with our court users group shortly. Uh, but in terms of talking to users about dealing with the recent crisis, uh, the structure which we have in place of users groups and regular um, liaison, both formal and informal, has helped us very much to deal with the, the crisis and make sure that the technological solutions that we have in place have worked. So um, we have a formal structure, but we also have regular um, conversations with court users via the groups of the bar and the local solicitors. And that has enabled us, for example, to deal with particular technological problems in the last year, which has been um, incredibly helpful. I think that's um, something that we've all learned in that um, we've found that it's necessary to involve the profession in the bar a lot more than we actually may have expected in the past uh, because without their buy-in and agreement it's very hard to make the courts operate in the unusual circumstances we've been facing yeah. and particularly when we've been going to hybrid hearings yes, which are quite. technologically so challenging quite uh, registrar uh, LOA from the DIFC, you've um, had your hand up. Thank you. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you for this uh, interesting uh, discussion. Uh, for us in the DIFC courts, we're part of the Dubai International Financial Center, uh, and we're a civil, uh, we're a common law uh, island in a civil law country, and we're such a young court uh, where we were actually working on the court users aspect uh, since the beginning of the court's inception. And especially since we have been an opt-in jurisdiction for parties around the world to choose the DIFC courts. And with that, uh, we have been, been very fond uh, in terms of uh, service excellence. So that is one of our four uh, pillars in the court. Uh, for us, as an opt-in jurisdiction, we really take care of our service from A to Z. Hence, we have been uh, implementing uh, different ways of getting feedback from our users. Uh, at some point, we call them users. We sometimes call them clientele. Uh, uh, for us as a court, it's quite important to hear uh, the demands of the community. So we've actually uh, were able to implement mystery shoppers uh, experience uh, in the court's day-to-day uh, -day operations. Uh, I believe we were the first court in the world to allow mystery shopping into the, the, the forums of the court. Uh, with that, we hear the whole perspective of how our front-facing uh, officers are dealing with our users, not just the lawyers. 
In addition to that, we have our court users committee, which has representations from international and local law firms, where we have a, a continued dialogue with them to understand uh, their needs uh, as they, of course, deal with the courts uh, every day. That's their bread and butter. Um, in addition to that, we have in-house counsel committee, uh, which has representations from uh, the biggest companies, you know, international financial institutions, internationally and regional, from a regional perspective. Uh, as we always know of course lawyers represent clients but we want to hear also from the clients to understand what their needs are as far as the court is concerned uh, so for us it has been a, a, a long journey in terms of uh, the service excellence uh, for us as you know a, a court always has a winning and losing party however for us it was quite a, an investment and focus to see how the journey is from a to z from the beginning of filing a claim until a case judgment uh, is issued. Uh, so for us, we've been really passionate uh, about uh, service, uh, and, and that is basically, in a nutshell, uh, how we deal with uh, court users. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, I would have the uh, confidence to engage in a mystery shopper exercise, but um, it's an interesting concept. Thank you. Uh, just before we move on to uh, perhaps some of our prepared speakers, uh, Justice Abigno from Uganda, you've had your um, hand up for some time. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much for the insightful discussion. Mine is just to add on the tools that we can use to ensure that we meet the needs of the court users. And this is in addition to what Justice Tokmit from Germany had talked about. In Uganda, we specifically have the Court Users Committee, and this is a forum where we engage with the different stakeholders, for example, the bankers, the financial institutions, the, the, court use, the, the advocates, the judicial officers, and all the other stakeholders in the commercial justice system. And that is a forum where we get feedback and discuss the challenges, opportunities, and the way forward on commercial justice. We also have the bar bench committee that is specifically designed to meet the interests of the advocates and the judicial officers in the dispensation of commercial justice in Uganda. And therefore we are able to get feedback, both positive and negative, on how to enhance commercial, the administration of commercial justice in Uganda. And now that we have the new normal, due to circumstances uh, brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic, we often have regulations and directives issued by the Honorable Chief Justice on how courts should operate and meet the different needs of the court users. And this is tailored particularly to ensure that the heads of the courts use their discretion to come up with procedures that align to the directives and that will ensure that we are able to serve the needs of the court users in this area. We also have the client's charter. We also have the client's charter, which we think actually needs to be reviewed because of the prevailing circumstances. And actually in our last meeting, which was held two weeks ago, we are in the process of reviewing our client's charter that is basically tailored to the commercial court of Uganda. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That's um, it, it, a theme seems to be that consultation with the users is very important. I think at this stage we'll ask uh, Sir Julian Flo to uh, comment on um, the issues we've been discussing. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, well, one of the principal ways in which the business and property courts in, in uh, England and Wales have keep attuned to the needs of court users is through users committees. Uh, each of our specialist courts has such a committee, the Chancery Court, the uh, Insolvency and Companies Court, the Commercial Court and the Technology and Construction Court. 
and we're in the process of organizing the first committee meeting of users of the financial list which is a joint venture between the de designated judges of the chancery division and of the commercial court to deal with financial disputes over uh, of over 50 million pounds requiring particular market expertise or raising issues of general market importance. The users committees uh, include representatives of the leading barristers, uh, chambers and solicitors who practice in the, in the relevant court, of, of specialist bar and uh, solicitors associations and of trade associations and other bodies, in other words, of the clients of, of the court. Uh, the commercial court users committee uh, also includes representatives of the arbitration community which has improved liaison between the two complementary sides of dispute resolution in our jurisdiction. As many of the judges of the relevant court as possible are encouraged to attend the meetings. Meetings are held three times a year. There is a discussion of the work of the court, uh, waiting times uh, for cases uh, and applications, uh, and statistics. Uh, the meetings afford the opportunity uh, for the users to raise matters of concern uh, and to make suggestions as to how uh, the practice and procedure of the business and property courts might be improved. Uh, users committees provide, we consider, a transparent and constructive means of communication between judges on the one hand and the users on the other, uh, sometimes enabling judges to appreciate problems or solutions that they had not previously identified. During the pandemic, uh, well, we have held our users meetings remotely uh, and one un unexpected bonus really of, of uh, that experience is that we found uh, there's been greater attendance remotely at the users meetings uh, than um, uh, there would normally be at a, a, an in-person meeting. I, mean, I think my experience when I was judge in charge of the commercial court is that you might get 30 people at a users committee meeting in person but the last commercial court users committee meeting we had, and Mrs. Justice Cockrell will remember the precise number, but I think it was something like 80 or 90 people uh, attending remotely. Uh, uh, a number of the procedural changes th that we've made in our business and property courts have come about as a consequence of uh, issues raised by users. Uh, an obvious example is the disclosure pile, which is currently operating in our courts. Uh, this arose as a consequence of concerns raised by the FTSE 100 companies and others about the cost and burden of disclosure, particularly electronic disclosure. Uh, and the pilot is intended to focus parties and their lawyers on limiting disclosure to documents which are really necessary for the determination of a particular issue or issues. But throughout the pilot, uh, the disclosure pilot working group, which I chair, um, uh, and which um, Mr. Justice Robin Knowles is also a member of, has consulted with users and practitioners and the specialist associations on ways in which the pilot can be improved. And there will continue to be detailed further con consultation before any permanent changes uh, might be made to our civil procedure rules. The consultation with and advice from users committees has proved invaluable in relation to other initiatives and improvements in our business and property courts, such as firstly, the development of the various court guides uh, in relation to which a working group comprising judges across the courts and practitioners is currently looking at the scope for harmonization of guides. And secondly, assistance with the system of electronic filing, which we have in our jurisdiction, C file. With the technological changes to the working of our courts that have been necess necessitated by the COVID-19 pandemic and what seems likely to be rapid commercial and procedural changes in the future, it seems likely that users' committees will become more valuable uh, than ever. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, contribute. Thank you. Good night. Am I? Yes, you're on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, good night, good morning, good day, everyone. Just to share a perspective from a small jurisdiction, uh, Jamaica has a population of just about 3 million people. Uh, and thanks for all the very useful um, contributions. 
In Jamaica, we have a consultative committee for the courts overall, chaired by the Chief Justice. Uh, uh, since the pandemic, uh, the Chief Justice has issued several practice directions to facilitate the virtual hearings, etc. cetera. Um, but we, do, we have not had this structured sort of um, con um, established mechanism as was just adumbrated. Perspective I'd like to raise though, and I don't know if you all have this issue, is that our commercial court has become very attractive because it is fairly well funded and the time between filing and trial um, compares most favorably to other courts. What we find is that users or litigants have been trying to squeeze matters in which are not probably strictly commercial matters. So for just one example, uh, a dispute with, about shares between a husband and a wife in the context of a divorce, the lawyer will file a, a minority shareholders claim. Here, maybe that is best looked at in the context of the entire property settlement, but they want the advantage of having the matter resolved in months rather than years. I'm just interested if, 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 if anybody has that experience, do we, to facilitate the user, sort of crack the door a little to allow matters in, or do we keep a strict commercial matter only and keep the user out and let them make their way through the other um, courts? Thank you. Thank you, Justice Butts. Um, uh, often the matter will come down, I, I, I expect, to resources and availability and demand on the court's time. But perhaps it's uh, timely now to move to another one of our prepared speakers, um, Registrar Grout from uh, Qatar. Thank you very much and greetings to everyone. I have been asked to focus specifically on identifying appropriate ways of courts keeping in touch with the needs of users. And I plan to do that by reference to the way in which the Qatar International Court has established its Court Users Committee, and in particular, how it has ensured that the committee has continued to function and add value in light of the present worldwide difficulties. The first point to note, and I'm sure it will be one that resonates with many of the other international commercial courts, is that the user base is very diverse. And so it is important to ensure that the membership of any court user committee is truly reflective of the people and bodies who use it or who are likely to do so. Taking Qatar as an example, the court user committee we have established comprises members of the court itself, legal practitioners from local and international law firms, in-house counsel from various companies and organizations, as well as representatives from relevant government and quasi-governmental entities, such as the regulatory authority, whose function it is to authorize and regulate firms and individuals conducting financial services in or from the Qatar Financial Center. It is also important to bear in mind that the court users are not limited to simply lawyers and members of the judiciary. Individual lay users also need representation which is why we have input from those involved in providing pro bono legal services to people who cannot afford representation, as well as representation from the specially established Employment Standards Office, which, among other things, assists the court with issues involving employment law and the rights of employees. Of course, with such a broad membership, keeping in touch with the community has in the past proven difficult not least because of the various commitments people have, both personally and professionally. Curiously, however, as a result of the pandemic, people have become much more adept at meeting virtually as we are today. And I have found that organizing online meetings of the court user committee is in fact a much simpler task than it ever was to try and convene a physical meeting. There is much to be said, therefore, for continuing with this trend, even once the effects of the pandemic subside. Another point worth making is this, that those who participate in court user committees should do so because they appreciate the value that their contributions have. It is no good convening a committee for convening a committee's sake. 
Conversely, if committee members feel that what they have to say may have a positive impact on the services provided by the court, as well as on the experience of its users, they are more likely to actively engage, making keeping in touch an easier task. There are a number of steps that can be taken to help facilitate this. First, a clear agenda should be prepared and circulated in advance of the meeting, members of the committee having been invited in advance to propose items for inclusion. Secondly, and fundamentally, the meeting must be competently chaired so as to ensure that all relevant items are appropriately addressed within the time available. Thirdly, and where practicable, all members should be given an opportunity to speak on particular issues of interest or concern. With larger court user committees, it will be necessary for the chair to ensure that contributions from individual committee members are time limited. Where it has not been possible for an individual to contribute as fully as they might have liked, they can be invited to submit anything further in writing following the conclusion of the meeting. As important as the meeting itself is what happens afterwards, Part of keeping users engaged is demonstrating that contributions have, where appropriate, been taken on board. Identifying action points and updating the committee periodically on progress will help to highlight the positive impact the work of the committee is having and should help to retain interest and commitment. Bearing in mind what I have said about the importance of keeping to time, I will finish my observations there. Thank you. Um, I think I'm now going to hand over to Justice Kataribi for the uh, to chair the rest of the session. Thank you, Justice Fleming. Uh, I think from the contributions made by the presenters and the questions and comments that have been made, it is clear to me that um, this pandemic has in a way been a wake-up call. Um, I remember when the pandemic broke I was Chief Justice of Uganda. And the initial reaction of the government was to issue a list of essential services that could be allowed to continue. And courts were not among the essential services. And it took quite a bit of persuasion and representations from the lawyers and other users for the courts um, to be recognized as an essential service to continue business and the rule of law. Let's have some other discussions. And I think as you can hear from Justice Susan Abinio, some progress has been made. Let's hear some other discussions from other people. Please put on your, put, uh, put up your hand and indicate and, and mute yourself and then we can, whom do I recognize? Justice. Justice. Huh? Thomas? Justice Chong of Singapore. Justice Chong of Singapore. Right. Thank you. Um, I, I thought it's important to um, recognize that the pandemic affects different industries differently. And I, th I believe that the effective way to address the peculiar needs of each industry is through the use of user committees. Uh, in Singapore, we have uh, the Admiralty Court User Committee, which is a um, model very similar to the UK model. So we have a um, user committee comprising uh, lawyers, um, uh, ship owners, agents, uh, people from the shipyard industry, the port authorities, etc. And during this pandemic, um, there was a um, feedback from the um, shipping community that because of the high uh, risk of infection in, in boarding uh, ships, uh, it may have an impact on the um, uh, arrest procedure. In most common law jurisdictions, uh, to effect an arrest on a ship, you need physical service. You need to board the vessel, you need to have a security guard. And uh, there was a view taken that uh, perhaps uh, um, it, it might expose these people who board the vessel with the risk of infection. So the user committee uh, reacted very uh, promptly and decided to amend our rules of court to allow um, a, a different form of service. A, we allow service on the agent by, by email. So we informed the agent and we believe that the agent will be in touch with the, the master and the master will be in touch with the, um, with the owner of the vessel. So that's the first important initiative uh, when we introduced the amendment to uh, 
uh, notify the agent rather than physical abort. Second, we, um, we will inform the Port Authority because uh, in our view, the key for a vessel to go to the next port is the port clearance. So if the vessel does not get port clearance, uh, it's not likely that the vessel will leave even though there's no security guard on board. Of course, you cannot eliminate completely um, the, the, the risk of, of the ship leaving while under arrest. But uh, having said that, you, you also can't uh, eliminate the risk even with one security guard on board. So the, my point is the use of user committee is very essential during this period because you know, different industries have different needs and it's just not possible uh, and not e efficient also for the courts to, 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 uh, um, to deal with um, the, the users from different uh, uh, kind of sectors, different industries. So the use of spe specialized uh, user committee, I think is, is the, perhaps the best way to deal with the needs of the, the community, business community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Chong. I think that's a very important point. Uh, but of course, the courts will have to have uh, basic rules while taking into account the needs of each individual, uh, the peculiarities of each individual user, but would apply across the board uh, to, to enable the courts to, to proceed. Uh, can we have another comment? Justice Cochrane. Justice Cochrane from England. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the points which have just been made uh, both by the most recent speaker and by uh, uh, Registrar Grout, I think are very good points. One needs to look at the needs of the individual uh, court user groups within the wider range of users. And one of the things that we have been doing is talking two subsets of the user group as well as the user group as a whole. And that's something which can feed back both ways. Um, I, I think Justice Lowe was uh, just saying that um, it's been possible to change rules to assist particular user groups. But we have been focusing also on ensuring that we know when litigation is going to be coming in, uh, court user group so that we can ensure we don't get too great a delay. So with COVID litigation coming in, talking to people who are likely to have that litigation to see when that will move forward. And that is impossible for user groups. But we have been focused on too great a delay. So with COVID talking to people who are likely to have the needs of our users better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I think we, before we ask anybody else to speak, let's bring in uh, our next speaker. Uh, Justice Kanan Ramesh from Singapore. Justice Kanan Ramesh from Singapore. Uh, thank you, Chief Justice uh, Katarabi. Uh, COVID-19 is a name that will not be forgotten, not least because of the economic devastation it has caused. The pandemic hit many sectors of the economy, but not always evenly. Hardest hit were micro, small, and medium enterprises, or MSMEs, often the bedrock of economies. As it is, MSMEs face challenges in resolving disputes and financial difficulties as they do not have the same access to professional advice and capital as big business. The pandemic exacerbated these limitations, raising access to justice issues and questions on whether existing tools were fit for purpose. Solutions were needed and quickly. Four areas of concern were identified and addressed. First, the pandemic impacted the ability to perform contractual obligations, leaving businesses facing the prospect of legal proceedings. Breathing space was needed to ride out the storm. A moratorium for a defined period was introduced for certain categories of commercial contracts. Second, the moratorium was not a panacea. It did not wash away pre-moratorium debt nor debt that would accrue during the moratorium. Rent was a concern. If landlords repossess premises post moratorium, there could be no business. The issue was resolved in two ways. First, providing rental relief for up to four months with the pain being shared between landlords and the government. Second, imposing a framework for repayment of accrued rent. Third, Insolvent SMS, as MSMEs needed support to restructure or wind up, depending on viability. 
a simplified insolvency program was introduced, which had two key features. First, a debt restructuring process, and second, a simplified liquidation process. The debt restructuring process was an adaptation of the prepackaged scheme arrangement in the statutes, while the simplified liquidation process was a light touch liquidation. Fourth, the pandemic changed the commercial assumptions of pre-pandemic contracts. The doctrines of frustration and force majeure were not complete answers. And even if they were, the issue needed to be ventilated in court. The surge in litigation that would result would have imposed an intolerable burden on the courts. The solution was a statutory realignment framework, which allowed parties to renegotiate certain categories of contracts. And if negotiations failed, to terminate the contracts on just and fair terms, the defining feature of which was to leave accrued obligations untouched and treat prospective obligations as discharged. Issues arising from these measures as a general rule did not require resolution in court. A team of assessors was mobilized for this purpose. Mediation and binding neutral evaluation were features embedded in the process. The consequence was speed, efficiency and the lowering of costs. But perhaps most importantly, the deluge of litigation that could have otherwise resulted was managed and contained. Finally, the courts remained open to hear essential and urgent matters during the lockdown that was introduced to minimize the spread of COVID-19. Invariably, insolvency filings of bigger corporations fell into this category as urgent relief was imperative. Many filings often involving cross-border elements and significant number of parties were from very early in the proceedings closely case, ma case managed and dealt with by electronic or phone hearings or on documents. Hearings were largely paperless. Uh, the, ins the insolvency bar or a rather user group of the insolvency bar was closely consulted on the various measures that were introduced. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Ramesh. Uh, can we have uh, one or two more contributions from members present? Can we have uh, another contribution from an African jurisdiction, Kenya? Registrar Tanui we made a contribution yesterday. What's happening in Kenya? Is there someone from Kenya? Or anybody else? Justice. Can please raise your hand if you want to make a contribution. Justice Lay, you want to? Then let me invite. Um... Yes. Chief Justice, uh, Justice uh, Pat. Is there. Yes, yes. Uh, we don't. This is from Malaysia. I'm just with Nalini from Malaysia. Just to provide yes. a slightly different, a slightly different perspective, we don't actually have a formal court user function. We generally had one. We generally have one, uh, whether there's a pandemic or not. But in response to the pandemic, uh, I would like to point out that our registrar did a fabulous job in the sense that the bar was essentially trained by them um, as they started to come in and start using the new technology. On a day-to-day -day basis, there would be dry runs. Uh, lawyers who were unfamiliar with the process were taught how to deal with it. And um, of course, we have consultations with the bar. But what was uh, remarkable was that initially, the bar was pretty difficult about uh, agreeing to any sort of virtual hearing. Um, we didn't have the legislation in place, but the minute the registrars had won them over by showing how easy it was uh, to function, particularly in the commercial courts, there was a tremendous change, almost exponential. So uh, we actually found that uh, even the most senior lawyers who'd been very, very defiant about it were quite happy to switch. And now we have a complete reversal and so it really looks like uh, the technology is here to stay. Uh, very much like Justice Stephen Chong said, we had similar issues with arrests, et cetera. 
and there we do have a court user committee and they did we did make the necessary uh, changes to allow them to carry out their duties accordingly. Um, yes, I, I think that's all I have to say, yes. I wouldn't agree with you more that technology is here to stay. Even the people that oppose technology now begin to see that uh, it's an enabling tool that uh, the world needs. Let me invite a contribution from Justice uh, Richard Field from Dubai. Justice Sir Richard Field, you have the floor. If we could just ask um, Richard to uh, unmute again. I think Chief Justice will need to will need to move on. Robin, it shows he's unmuted, but he's not, I don't hear him. Yes, I'm not sure we're going to resolve that technological problem. Uh, with regret, we'll need to move on. Okay. I think we're, we're getting quite close to uh, the end of our session, I, I fear. Yeah. Um, I think I have to invite Justice Brennan to, to take over from here. <laughs> Thank you, Justice Gattarivi. Uh, in closing the session, uh, I would like to acknowledge the work of um, the Chief Justice Menon and his team in Singapore, uh, bearing the brunt of putting this conference together, and also uh, the work of Lord Thomas and his steering committee, I'd also like especially to uh, mention Justice Knowles, who I know has attended meetings at some very unreasonable hours in the morning in the UK to ensure things work. Um, in relation to this session, I thank our two main speakers, Chief Justice Orsop and Judge Jan Tolkmit, for their thoughtful addresses. And I'd like to acknowledge the contributions from the commentators during the session and from participants. I think the um, engagement from the participants in this session shows how committed people are to uh, the servicing the needs of court users. COVID-19 has affected the world we all live in in various ways. But despite the impact of COVID-19, businesses and economies are still operating. Commercial business and entities are the lifeblood of the economy and are already driving economic recovery around the world those businesses continue to need to have recourse to the courts. Courts provide essential services. I was interested to hear just uh, comments that some uh, governments do not consider the courts to be essential services, uh, but the restriction on business as usual under COVID-19 has certainly challenged our respective courts to rethink the way we operate and how we can continue to meet the needs of our court users. I think the themes that came through from the pre-prepared material and from what we've heard during the course of this session is uh, the close relationship and needs of uh, arbitration, uh, the arbitration uh, community, uh, the needs of commercial courts in particular to engage with users and to respond perhaps to users in a way that we may not have thought of in the past and to engage with user groups in specific uh, cases. And perhaps also uh, it's been a timely reminder that some of our processes perhaps need to be reviewed to ensure they're uh, amenable uh, to the different circumstances under which we operate. 
But underlying it all, of course, is the need for the courts to uh, continue to maintain the rule of law. And that in itself means that we do need to uh, have our users on board because they have to accept and respect the uh, work the courts do. So I found this uh, session actually very stimulating and enjoyed it. And I would like to thank all the uh, contributors very much. Thank you very much.